By 2050, Muslim population in the world can rise up to 30% of the total population. But what about India? No matter how secular or liberal you are, you cannot ignore the historical fact that Islam has been associated with conquest where conversion or death were often the choices presented. World has a long history of Islamic conquest and specifically Bharat. A lot of our land was lost to invaders, be it today's Pakistan or Afghanistan. The phrase, history repeats itself, comes to our mind, prompting us to reflect on these past events. So, is Islamophobia real? And will India become an Islamic nation in future? What is the reality of Vakfabod? Or it's just a political propaganda? Hi guys, my name is Harry and welcome to another thought-provoking video. Our history is so diverse and ancient that every religion, be it Vedic Sanatan Dharma or Puranic Hinduism, Buddhism or Sikhism, Jainism or Zoroastrianism, Islam or Christianity, has its own place in history books. But over time, many people have converted to Islam and Christianity more than any other religion. This trend can be attributed to proactive missionary efforts of both the religions aimed at spreading their faith through various means. Let's start by delving into the history of Islam in India. From the early Arab invasion led by Muhammad bin Qasim to the establishment of Islamic dynasty such as the Delhi Sultanate, the subcontinent has witnessed significant historical milestones that shaped the spread of Islam in India. Muhammad bin Qasim led the first Arab invasion of the Indian subcontinent in the early 8th century. Although his conquests were limited to the region of Sindh in present-day Pakistan, but they marked the beginning of Islamic rule in the Indian subcontinent. Followed by Mahmud Ghazni in 1000 CE and then Muhammad Ghori in the 12th century, who left one of his slaves, Qutbuddin Abak of Mamluk dynasty, also known as Slave dynasty, to rule over Delhi. And that's how the Delhi Sultanate was established in the 13th century. Post which, Khiljis, Tughlaqs, Sayyids and Lodis ruled for next 300 years. But things changed in 1526 CE when Babur emerged victorious by defeating Ibrahim Lodi in the first battle of Panipat. And they continued to rule until 1857, known as the Sepoy Mutiny or First War of Independence which marked commencement of British rule over most of the subcontinent. From 8th century to 19th century, a lot of people were converted and few settled in the subcontinent, which marked expansion of Islam in Bharat. A lot of Hindus were martyred, including Sikh Guru Guru Tegh Bahadur and Guru Gobind Singh, to fight against the atrocities of Aurangzeb. But after 1947 and dividing Bharat, around 25% of Muslim population which was approx 14.5 million people migrated to Pakistan and around 35.4 million chose to stay. Currently, around 172 to 200 million and 15% of Indian population follows Islam. According to Wikipedia, Islam is the fastest growing religion in India. But is it even possible that India will become an Islamic state in future? So now let's look at that how and why Islam is growing so rapidly. In the northern, central, eastern and western region of India, Islam was introduced through violent invasions. While in the south, particularly along the Malabar coast, it spread peacefully through the efforts of Arab merchants and traders. These merchants established settlements and trading posts, fostering culture and religious exchange that also welcomed Sufi missionaries. Since independence, the spread of Islam has been generally more peaceful. However, there are still instances of manipulation and conversion. Moving on to the present day, we'll explore contemporary issues related to Islam in India. This includes discussion on conversion, foreign investment and demographic trends. By examining these factors, we can gain insights into the evolving landscape of religious identity in India. Islamic conversion is more targeted towards the lower caste and most of them are mainly because they are promised education, a relief from untouchability, money and upliftment in social status. Some of them are introduced by someone who has converted and some voluntarily seek refuge in Islam. But the problem with quantifying this statement is that we don't have data. 
But are these conversions a topic of concern? We'll come back to this later in the video. The second concern, as you may know or have heard, relates to foreign investment and the promotion of Islam in India. We went into this topic in detail in our Kerala story video, which I encourage you to watch after this. In short, Wahhabism is a sect of Islam that consider itself to be a direct follower of the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and consider itself superior to other Muslims. As a result, a huge amount of money flows through legal channels and illegal channels such as Hawala to promote Islam in India. And some of this money is used to promote violence and carrying out attacks posing a threat to India's stability. Another concern might be the growing population of Muslims in India. In 1947, Muslims were 9% of the total population. And currently, as per the last census that happened in 2011, they're around 15%. So you can say that they are growing around 1% every 10 years. While in the rest of the world, the growth rate of Muslim population is around 2.2% annually. When we tried to gather data that how many people were actually converted to Islam, we were unable to find any credible source that would paint a picture for us. And when you talk about forced conversions, there is still no data available. So you would think that there is nothing so alarming that would be a reason of concern. But then enters land jihad. Yes, land jihad, not love jihad. Some of you might be familiar with Waqf Abode. Central Waqf Council was a statutory body established by Indian government under the Waqf Act in 1995. So this act empowers the council, which is the Waqf Abode, to manage, register and provide legal protection to the Waqf properties and use that property for the benefit of Muslim community with no interference from the state. Now, what are Waqf properties? So Muslims can voluntarily donate their properties for the welfare of the Muslim community. This means that this land would be used for healthcare, education and building of a mosque. And the board ensures that this land which is donated by a Muslim cannot be used for any of the personal use. But why is it becoming a problem? By chance, if there is a dispute on this property, for example, someone claims the ownership of the land while that property was already donated, then dispute handling will be done by Waqf board and not by court. And that provision resulted in a very big issue. Do you know who has the most land or properties in India? Number one, of course, would be the Indian government. The Catholic Church stands at number two. And number three goes to the Waqf board. It is alleged that a lot of properties which were owned by people of different faith or religion were illegally acquired by the Waqf board. But how? Well, what happens is that, for example, you purchased a property from a Muslim and start using it for your personal use let's say farming, then suddenly one day you see a board on your property that it's owned by the Waqf board. When you approach them, you are informed that this property was donated to the Waqf board by the previous owner. And to dispute this, you cannot seek help from legal system. But this dispute will be resolved by the Waqf board itself. Currently, the Waqf board owns 6,17,000 immovable properties in India which has raised concerns on their acquisition. And that has resulted in a PIL which was filed in 2020 to Supreme Court to seek reports on misuse of properties owned by Waqf board. So if I have to conclude that if India will become an Islamic state, honestly, I don't have a concrete answer. Because in history, the most unlikely events have always shaped the world that we live in. Currently, Christianity is the largest religion, followed by Islam, but also, Islam started 600 years after Christianity. The reason why both the religions have expanded so much is because of their nature. Islam and Christianity are focused on conversions, while Hinduism and Sikhism are based on tradition and lineage. So guys, we have looked at a lot of challenges, but it's crucial to find out if there are any solutions. Let's talk about a few. First, we need to educate ourselves on our own religion history and understanding the meaning behind the rituals. Second, empower the backward communities. As we talked about conversion being mainly targeted towards lower class societies, if we can provide them protection, education and a social status and a security that they will not be ill-treated by upper class, that would give them one less reason to get inclined towards other religion. 
Rich history of Bharat tells us the reason we are the oldest surviving religion is because of our values and will to protect our culture. At the same time, we should keep in mind that because of a few, we should not target the entire community. At the time of partition, more than 75% of Muslim population chose to stay in India. 70% of the current Muslims consider themselves as patriot. A lot of Muslim freedom fighters gave their life in fighting the British. So let me know in the comments, what do you think about the increasing Islamic population in the world? Will India become an Islamic country? And thanks a lot for joining in our journey through the diverse landscape of Islam in India. Thanks for watching. And if you have reached till here, then don't forget to subscribe and like the video. This is Harry signing off. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat.